Hello everyone, welcome to Decades. In today's video, we're on the Salisbury Plain in Wiltshire. It's a lovely chalk plateau not far from the city of Salisbury, world renowned for its famous cathedral that people come from as far as Russia just to visit. But the reason we've come today is to visit one of the most famous historical landmarks in the UK, and maybe even one of the most famous historical landmarks in the world. It's an ancient site of mystery and stone, one that's thousands of years old. So join me today as in this video, we're going to be exploring the history of Stonehenge. Stone circles aren't a rarity in the British Isles. There are at least over a thousand of them. One's not very far up the road from Stonehenge in Avebury. Stone circles are typically late Neolithic and early Bronze Age monuments, characterised by a ring of standing stones, many of which are roughly 5,000 years old. And what sets Stonehenge apart and makes it perhaps the most famous of them all is its architectural sophistication. There appears to be more meat on these bones. Or should I say stones? Perhaps the most interesting place to start with Stonehenge is its age. The story of this site begins approximately 10,000 years ago, in a time when the landscape looked vastly different. The Salisbury Plain, like much of England, was covered in open woodland with grassland clearings. It would be completely unrecognisable from today, though I'm imagining that has a lot to do with the absence of roads and noise pollution caused by combustion engines that didn't exist yet. On top of that, the scenery would be much wilder than fields divided by strategically placed hedges as far as the eye can see. But you get the picture I'm trying to paint, nature was far more replete. The earliest known structures in the immediate vicinity to where Stonehenge is today were four to five pits that held wooden totem pole-like posts measuring two and a half feet in diameter, believed to have been erected in the Mesolithic period between 8500 BCE and 7000 BCE, possibly for a ritualistic purpose. It's unclear if these posts had any correlation to what we know today as Stonehenge whatsoever. However, they were discovered beneath the old visitor's car park that remained in use until 2013. A few millennia down the line in the earlier Neolithic period, a causeway enclosure featuring long barrow tombs would be constructed at Robin Hood's Ball, two and a half miles to the northwest of Stonehenge. A settlement at what's referred to as Blick Mead was also discovered only one and a half miles from the stones we see before us today. It's located just outside of Amesbury next to a dual carriageway, because why of course? The universities of Buckingham Humanities Research Institute would state their belief that the community that lived on this site may have been the ones responsible for the construction of the landmark that has fascinated and equally perplexed an unfathomable number of people ever since. So as you can see, the landscape itself is dotted with these telltale signs of prehistoric human activity, making Stonehenge the tip of the iceberg in this fascinating region of England. As for the monument itself, it was constructed over the course of several phases, spanning a total of approximately 1500 years, with the first generation of the monument being believed to have been constructed at some time around 3100 BCE. It consisted of a circular bank with a ditch enclosure made of late Cretaceous Seaford chalk and measured 110 metres or 360 feet in diameter, with an entrance on the northwest side and a smaller entrance to the circle south. The location was ever so slightly sloped, something that was actually later taken into account when constructing the stones to create a level finish. The ditch would consist of deer and oxen bones as well as worn out tools. As for what stood within the circle, though limited evidence suggests it, it has been speculated that perhaps a timber circle stood before the stone one. This is because of a series of over 50 pits, each sitting at one metre in diameter, which wouldn't be abnormal. 
only two miles to the northeast of Stonehenge, one can find Woodhenge, a Neolithic timber monument dated to around 2500 BCE. Of course, timber doesn't typically last that long, so you'll have to settle for concrete markers as to where the posts were, but it's worth a visit if you're ever in the area. Another theory for these pits is that they were markers of foundations for a bluestone circle, which would have stood 500 years prior to any known stone monuments. Human remains were also discovered in these Aubrey holes as they became known, named after John Aubrey, an English 17th century antiquarian and philosopher believed to be the one who identified the pits to begin with. It's believed that as many as 150 individuals may have initially been buried at the site. Somewhere between the years of 2900 and 2600 BCE, the second phase of the monument's construction would be undertaken. It's believed further standing timbers would be erected at the northeast entrance to the site, accompanied by a parallel alignment of irregularly spaced posts running into the circle from the southern entry. These post holes were 16 inches in diameter. But things got interesting going into Stonehenge's third phase of construction. It's at this point when the prehistoric humans behind the site would forego the use of timber and turn to stone. Two arrays of holes would be dug at the centre of the site, making for stone sockets holding up to 80 standing stones, comprising an inner horseshoe shaped structure and an outer circle. The massive sarsen stones would be brought to the site somewhere between 2600 and 2400 BCE, originating from a quarry approximately 16 miles to the north of the site in West Woods. The stones would be given mortise and tenon joints before being erected as an over 100 foot wide circle of standing stones with 30 lintel stones resting atop them fixed in place with tongue and groove joints. For context on just how long ago this was, even though 200 years is a massive margin of error for a comparison, it was around a similar time that the Great Pyramid of Giza would be constructed over in Egypt. Anyway, each standing stone stands at 13 feet or 4.1 meters in height, 6.9 feet or 2.1 meters in width, weighing at around 25 tons a pop. That's something you don't really expect until you're on the ground in front of the stones. They're huge. Moving them any distance, much less erecting them upright, would have been an enormous obstacle for a Neolithic construction crew. But it's the blue stones inside the outer circle that came from even farther afield. Weighing between 2 and 5 tons each, they are believed to have come from the Preseli Hills in southwest Wales. And I don't know if I pronounced that correctly, but knowing Wales, I probably didn't. In a time before A roads and motorways, that must have been one mammoth of an undertaking to move the stones the best part of 200 miles, especially when you consider they were millennia shy of being able to shift them in an articulated line. One theory for how the quarry workers accomplished this is that they used some rather heavy duty wooden sledges, dragging them a very long distance at very slow speeds. Another theory is that the people behind moving the stones used wooden logs to roll the stones painstakingly from their point of origin to their final destination here on the Salisbury Plain. It's believed the arrangement of the stones would be resorted a couple of times over the centuries to come, however this phase would not be truly completed until around 1600 BCE, meaning that between when construction was estimated to have first began to its completion, Stonehenge took around 1500 years to be completed. I think it's fair to say that doesn't mean it was under construction the entire time, but Stonehenge was added to by different generations across that time span to become the monument that we see before us today. One that would find itself having no shortage of mysteries. And where there are mysteries, there will inevitably be theories. The biggest Stonehenge mystery of all being, why exactly does it exist? Why go to these lengths to pile up stones in an aesthetically satisfying way in a field in southern England? What exactly is Stonehenge? What significance does this place hold? And what does it mean? Well, there's certainly an awful lot to unpack here. The culture behind Stonehenge's construction did not write down its own history, meaning aspects such as Stonehenge's actual purpose 
remain relatively open to discussion. Various parts of the site, including the heel stone, line up perfectly with the sunset of the winter solstice and the opposing sunrise of the summer solstice, meaning it's possible the site marked the seasons. At either solstice, Stonehenge is lined up perfectly, indicating that perhaps the stones were used to mark the seasons where the days got longer and of course where they got shorter. Most interestingly, this line is followed by a natural landform at the location and perhaps that aided the reasoning for the monstrous task of constructing these stones in the first place. Deeper astronomical associations however are speculated but unconfirmed. Other proposed theories for Stonehenge's mysterious function are that it served as something of a religious site, or maybe it was an observatory of sorts, perhaps it was a place of healing. It's entirely possible of course that the site was multifunctional, meaning it may have been used for several purposes both different to and overlapping with the theories already mentioned. As we've already gone over, there may have been some burial significance to the site too, but other mysteries surrounding Stonehenge pertain to the methods used to actually construct it, of which there is little evidence to shed light on exactly how the stones came to stand where they do. It has been proven that basic Neolithic technology such as an early version of shear legs are effective in moving and placing stones of similar mass, an experiment with a large sleigh carrying a 40 ton stone slab would be carried out near the site in 1995 with more than 100 people pulling it along slowly for 18 miles. Conspiracy theorists have no shortage of ideas either. Maybe aliens did it, perhaps it was the lizard people. And that's all the credibility I wish to afford that. Many a folktale detail fanciful means in which Stonehenge may have come to be, including the idea that the devil himself was responsible, or that the legendary wizard Merlin enlisted the aid of a giant to build the scene. Maybe the site was erected as penance for a bad deed, or maybe it was a symbol of peace and unification. The truth is, I don't think we will ever truly know with 100% certainty what Stonehenge's full purpose really was without having to use our logic to come to some conclusions at least, and we may not even know fully how it came to be constructed. This is a monolith to a time before people on the British Isles recorded much in the way of their own history. There are some engravings on the stones of tools and the like that suggests aliens probably didn't do it, and that's about it. From the perspective of a casual enjoyer of history anyway, some people have dedicated their lives to understanding these here stones. Maybe they have a better idea than I could possibly come to understand in researching this place for a YouTube video. I personally like the idea that Stonehenge was deliberately built to confuse us, because I too would love to build a monument just to confuse generations far in the future. However, the video doesn't end there. See, just because Stonehenge was built thousands of years ago and the civilization behind this masterpiece of stone is long gone, doesn't mean that Stonehenge stopped existing in the history in between. By the time the Romans arrived in Britain, Stonehenge was already well over 2,000 years old. It was ancient even to some of the mighty ancient civilizations. With many Roman objects being found at the site, Stonehenge appears to have been visited rather frequently. It's had a fairly minimal role over the years, but the site has been marvelled at for centuries, fizzing in the imaginations of those who saw it. For example, the oldest known depiction of the stones is dated to the 14th century, where a giant is helping Merlin build Stonehenge in a manuscript compiled by Norman poet Robert Weiss, which I probably pronounced wrong. For as long as history has been recorded in Britain, Stonehenge and monuments like it have been the subject of many studies and stories. The first realistic art piece depicting Stonehenge is this watercolour painting by Flemish artist Lucas de Heer and is dated to the late 16th century. And as time went on, the stones would find themselves slanting over, making for a much more jagged appearance than seen today. This would result in major restoration efforts throughout the 20th century to bring Stonehenge back to life, I guess is one way of putting it. Stonehenge would also see a wave of neo-paganism in the 20th century, with the first neo-druid group to perform a ceremony at the site being the Ancient Order of Druids in 1905. The gathering held would be mocked by the press because the so-called druids wore funny robes and fake beards, which to me honestly just sounds like a great time. 
After all, it is my belief that everybody should be entitled to a beard, be it real or fake. Moving on, during the First World War, an aerodrome would be constructed very close by to Stonehenge, and along with it came a road and several buildings. The site would sell in 1915 for £6,600, before the site was eventually donated by its then owner Cecil Chubb to the nation in 1918. A decade or so later, an appeal was launched to preserve the site, especially against the encroachment of development. The land around the site would be purchased again, resulting in the removal of the buildings that surrounded Stonehenge. However, the roads would remain. There would be more neo-pagan events going into the later 20th century, particularly between the years of 1972 and 1984, when Stonehenge became the site of the Stonehenge Free Festival in June, culminating of course with the summer solstice. This event grew in size into the 1980s when it would attract tens of thousands of people. Attendees would be branded as hippies and the increase in drug use at the event would cause Stonehenge's access to become increasingly restricted. This would result in an event known as the Battle of the Beanfield in 1985, where over the course of several hours on the 1st of June, Wiltshire police prevented the peace convoy from establishing the 1985 Stonehenge Free Festival due to a High Court injunction prohibiting the event outright. The battle, if you can call it that, consisted of 600 travellers and 1,300 police officers and resulted in the festival not taking place. It was not a peaceful affair, the police were reported to have been hitting anybody they could reach, and the police were apparently pelted with wooden lumps, stones, and apparently on occasion, petrol bombs. Hundreds of travellers would be apprehended by the authorities, with dozens of their numbers injured, and this event was regarded as one of the largest mass arrests since the Second World War, and possibly even longer. These parties, albeit to a much smaller scale, would eventually be allowed to continue, and into the 21st century an open summer solstice event would begin to be held at the site. As a result of the significant amounts of erosion on the stones, access to the interior of the stone circle has been restricted and roped off since the late 1970s. To this day, visitors are not permitted to physically touch the stones and must stay behind a rope cordon and simply walk around the site from a semi-decent distance away. That being said, there are exceptions during particular events such as the summer and winter solstice, and apparently you can make special bookings for deeper access to the site, but don't quote me on that. Even still, one solid rule remains, please don't touch the stones. Today this World Heritage site is looked after and maintained by English Heritage. I can't say it was my favourite place to visit ever, but I certainly got something out of the experience. But whichever way you look at it, these fascinating mysterious stones have stood for thousands of years. And whatever their purpose happened to be, regardless, they are massively impressive. And I can only hope that this video has done them at least some degree of justice. But as for what you might get out of visiting Stonehenge, the only way to know for sure is to get yourself down here and have a look. And if you do, don't forget to respect the site. And I reckon that brings us nicely to the end of today's video. Thank you all for watching, I really hope that you've enjoyed. Be sure to go ahead, leave a like, subscribe, share the channel with your friends and all that wonderful stuff if you did. We will of course massively appreciate it. And with any luck, hopefully we will see you all very soon with another video at some point. But until next time, please take care. Don't forget to thank the aliens for Stonehenge. And goodbye.